In these uncertain economic times, it's easy to be worried about protecting your wealth, your hard-earned savings, and your family's financial future. Plunging interest rates, the devaluating dollar, and political unrest constantly threaten what you have worked hard to earn and all that you own. That's why now it's more important than ever to protect your assets and have the money you need to make your dreams come true. Welcome to the Global Wealth Fortress Report with successful global entrepreneur and wealth preservation expert, Joel Nagel. Joel's helped thousands of people just like you protect what you have so that you can make even more and make your every dream come true. So, sit back and enjoy Joel Nagel's offshore expert advice on how you can live the good life at a great price, where the sun never sets on your financial fortress. Hello, this is Carter Clues, AKA Carib Carter, president of the Offshore Club. And I am really thrilled today because this is the first episode of the show which is actually hosted by, I'm just the, the, the Mr. Interlocker here today. The show is actually Joel Nagel's um, Wealth Fortress Report, okay? And uh, Joel, you're down in Belize, and I am thrilled for starting this first episode of this new series of podcasts that's going to be coming to people every Thursday at 2 o'clock. Very important topic, very important topic. Well, thank you, Carter. It's great to be with you. And uh, thanks for agreeing to uh, work with me on the show. I look forward to working with you. Well, Joel, I think I think when I say a very important topic, I don't think that you are. First, let me put it in perspective for people. Um, a lot of you know me because you watch uh, Coffee with Carib Carter every Monday at noon. If you don't, you should be. Um, I have to get my own plug in here, Joel. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> expect that shameless plug every week but it's it's very very timely because i don't think that asset protection which you are the maven of asset protection folks joel is america's number one asset protection attorney okay so if you have any assets you know from a couple bucks to a couple million this is a vitally important show the, the entire podcast series that's going to be coming up for the next weeks, months, hopefully years. And and Joel, particularly this episode, uh, at a time when it, you get the calls from clients coming to you for asset protection. Let me ask you a question. And folks, I don't know the answer to this, but I have a feeling what it's going to be. Have you ever had more of a deluge of people coming to you worried about their assets? Yeah, absolutely not, Carter. I mean, for the you know, I've been at this now 32 years and the first, you know, 20 years of our practice was pretty traditional. We're helping physicians and financial advisors and people that uh, were used to sort of being sued as part of their, um, as part of their, let's call it an occupational hazard, right? That, right. That's the classic asset protection, but we've seen it spread in so many different directions from people worried about the value of their currency right? Protecting their nest egg from a purchasing power perspective to, you know, purchase, uh, protecting their most important asset, which is themselves. We see more and more people concerned about, about our country, their ability to travel. I think COVID dr uh, drove that point home. At one point, uh, the U.S. passport, which allowed visa-free travel to about 150 countries, you know, at the height of COVID dropped to only 26 countries. So all of a sudden people couldn't travel, people worried about the value of the dollar, they're worried about being sued, they're worried about taxes, they're worried about you know, leaving money to their children. You know, all those things uh, play into asset protection one way or another. So it's a very broad topic. You know, don't think that, oh, I'm not worried about being sued, so I don't need to worry about asset protection. It's, it's certainly much, much broader than that. Well, absolutely. And, and I want to I want to point out, I want to reiterate, because I referenced it a few minutes ago, that if people have a lot of people think, well, you know, if I was a millionaire or a multimillionaire, then I'd worry about asset protection. But all I have is my home and a small bank account. Let's write at the outset here, the first episode of the Wealth Fortress Report. Let's address that, Joel. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, everybody's worried about their assets. And in fact, I would say, 
people who have less assets worry about them more because they can't be replaced. So frequently I'll get a call from somebody who's maybe uh, newly retired. They don't have huge assets, uh, but it scares them to death. They're worried that they're gonna outlive their money. Uh, they're worried if something goes wrong, maybe a the lawsuit or you know hyperinflation. I mean, I think that's the thing on many people's minds right now with the government just printing, printing, printing. I don't know about you, but you know, I last time I went to the grocery store, I was uh, absolutely shocked. I mean, uh, everything, everything is going up in 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 price. And you know, if hyperinflation continues uh, and your assets are are um, fixed assets or uh, denominated in dollars, so let's say fixed pensions and social security and things like that, then of course you worry about asset protection. You can see the purchasing power of your money eroding right before your eyes. Right before your eyes. I think right now, and we need to put this in perspective for people, folks, right now, the inflation rate, the inflation rate, do not believe for one minute that it's six to seven percent. Now, I know those of you who do like I do and do your own shopping, no, it ain't six to seven percent, okay? But if you go to, and I know you're familiar with him, Joel, John Williams at Shadow Stats, okay? Absolutely. This is someone you can rely on. He's never been a politician. He says that right now it's at 13.4 percent and skyrocketing, okay? We just yeah, certainly, I can certainly believe that. I mean, even the government's own official statistics, they, you know, they exclude so many things, they exclude. You know, energy. They exclude. Uh, you know, food. They. They. It's just. It's just absolutely crazy. And you know, if you look at something, and I'm not putting in a pitch for any particular investment. Um, you know, we we do broach investments on this on this show, but not as an investment advisor, but from the standpoint of asset protection. So, if you look at something, whatever you want to pick, you want to pick real estate. You want to pick gold. You know, for the younger people, you want to pick Bitcoin. Why are all those things surging? Well, they're surging because, you know, nobody wants to sell you whatever good that is in yesterday's dollars. They're going to reprice it based on the exact inflation rate that you're talking about. And, you know, look at Bitcoin, for example. I mean, it's, it's, I think this morning I looked at $63,000. It's, it's yeah. just off of its all time high. And the more the government prints, uh, the more inflation there is, you're going to see uh, that price just continue to go crazy. A lot of people are talking about, you know, Bitcoin um, going over a hundred thousand. Uh, we're talking about, you know, gold going over five or ten thousand. Uh, and these people think it, it can't happen. Hyperinflation in the U.S. It, it absolutely can. If you go back to Germany in the 1920s, uh, it took two years, only two years, for the price of gold, which was fixed. One ounce of gold uh, it, it was 100 Reichsmarks. Um, and two years later, the same ounce of gold was 100 trillion. And that's with the T. 100 trillion Reichsmarks what, by that same ounce of gold. What, what were yeah. those numbers again? Give me those numbers again. From 100 Reichsmarks for an ounce of gold to 100 trillion Reichsmarks for an ounce of gold in two years. Two years. So, you know, if anybody thinks, oh, well, this can't happen, it's not going to happen. Uh, you've heard the administration talk about transitory inflation. I honestly don't know what that term means. I don't know that any economist worth his salt would would agree with that um, concept that, you know, I guess the, the, the notion is that uh, because some of the supply chain has been disrupted, we're having these very temporary bouts of inflation, but you know that's simply not the case. You yeah. cannot print trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars and dump them into the US economy uh, and not expect there to be inflation. That's just impossible to have anything other than that. So while in the past we were focusing on helping people that were trying to protect themselves from lawsuits, and we still are, we still get those calls every day, uh, but, the, but the bigger concern going down to the question you ask somebody that's got fifty thousand dollars, they have a two hundred thousand dollar home, they have they're on social security, they're on a fixed pension. You know what should they do? I mean, asset protection is absolutely um, invaluable. You know, you have to do something. You can't have all your proverbial eggs in the U.S. dollar basket, or that's extremely dangerous. Extremely dangerous. We, we, well, we need to keep in mind that the Fed, 
now prints $120 billion a month. To put that in perspective, you did a great job of putting what happened in Germany in perspective. Folks, that's as much money per month as the U.S. printed in the previous 200 years. So that's just a frightening thought. And every one of those fiat dollars that Powell and Yellen and Biden print lessens the value of the dollar in your pocket. So, of course. yeah. I mean, I, I, I read last a week or two ago when they were in the, you know, the impasse on the dollar, uh, excuse me, on the budget. Um, you know, this article came out about one way to resolve it would just be to print a trillion dollar coin which the Biden administration could do and then deposit into the Federal Reserve and that would solve all the problems like it's some magic fairy dust. I mean, you know, these guys really don't have a clue about how, how economics works. The reason we have not had runaway inflation before now, because remember, Biden isn't the person that started printing money. Trump was printing money. Yep. You know, you go, you go all the way back. Bush, Clinton, uh, yep. Obama, they're all printing money. Yep. So why why haven't we seen runaway inflation before? I mean, first of all, we export in inflation to other countries because other countries are even worse than the U.S. So if you're, for example, Venezuelan, you know, and your inflation rate is 10,000% a month, of course, you'd much rather have a U.S. dollar than, you know, than the Venezuelan Bolivar. So that, that soaked up a lot of demand. A lot of demand for our currency gets sucked up artificially, uh, for example, by oil purchases, because the global oil you know, marketplace is priced in dollars. So if let's say, again, to use Germany as an example, you're a German oil company and you want to buy oil from a company in Kuwait. Can you use your own currency, the euro? No, you can't. No, you can't. You have to, you have to buy dollars then use those dollars to buy oil. So that's that creates tremendous artificial demand for our currency every day. But, you know, and sometimes people will ask me, when, when will the crash of the U.S. dollar take place? I say, look, I, you know, I'm not Nostradamus. I don't have any, you know, special insight or crystal ball. But the minute that you read on the Wall Street Journal that the, that the OPEC countries have changed the base currency of oil from dollars to anything else, let's just say euros. Now all of a sudden, instead of the German changing his euros to dollars to buy oil, it'll be you and me changing our dollars to euros to buy that same barrel of oil. The pendulum will have completely swung from one end to the other. And you know, just to keep it in perspective, when the when the when the pound sterling you know, it wasn't at the. It wasn't immediately at the end of World War II. It was, you know, about ten years later in the fifth. Right. You know, right. in the Suez Canal. There, there was a moment in time when the pound sterling stopped being the world reserve currency. And when that, and when that happened, the pound sterling dropped about forty percent. And I have no reason to believe that we would have a, any different experience if, if all of a sudden. You know, the, you, you already see the cracks in the wall. The Chinese and the Russians are trading in, in, in their own currencies. You have more and more countries hostile to the U.S. not wanting to trade in dollars. But when oil and some of those big things starts trading in other currencies or, you know, you know they're, they're going to price it in Bitcoin or whatever, anything besides the dollar, that'll be the end. Not the end of the dollar. It won't be. The dollar will still be a useful currency. But it will be the end of the dollar hegemony and, and it being the world reserve currency. And when that happens, you can expect the price of the dollar to fall in a similar way, 30, 40, 50 percent uh, overnight. And, you know, people say, well, I can't believe that, um, you know, it would be, you know, two two dollars to a euro, let's say, or or three dollars to a pound. Yeah, it, it could easily happen. And very easily. Very easily. And, and you know. I'm like you, uh, Joel, I'm not Nostradamus, but I did used to write for the Psychic Friends Network. So I do have a prediction, a okay. prophecy, and here's mine. And I am going to be an alarmist. Folks, Joel, your, your analysis was so brilliant because it was 1956 when that happened, the Suez Crisis. And folks, think about this. That had been the reserve currency, Harold Macmillan. The prime minister of England sent a three word message to Dwight Eisenhower. Three, over to you. That's it. And yeah. that was the end. Essentially, the British Empire, as well as their reserve currency. Sure. Right now, Russia, China, 
Iran and Turkey are all teaming up to remove the U.S. as, as the reserve currency. Joel, that makes oh. asset protection vital. Of course. And and unfortunately, again, it's not just the Biden administration, administrations before him as well, but they, they weaponize the dollar, right? Yes. And, and the, you know, the, the dollar should be our currency. It should really have nothing to do with, you know, being put in a position of being weaponized. The minute you weaponize it, then, you know, you create allies and you create adversaries. And we've created more and more and more adversaries. You know, the the war on on uh, terror, the war on drugs, the war on this, the war on that. Why not have those wars, but not include the currency itself, right? Because most of it isn't really about the, those crimes because those crimes are the tip of the iceberg compared to the general usage, the power it's given the government to control our lives. I think you, you probably saw last week, they were talking about um, being able to get every transaction and every bank account in the US uh, that has over $600 in it. I mean, that's everybody. And everybody. You know, that has nothing to do with crime. Everybody. But then you take, that, you take that to the international level and you know we, we put sanctions on countries. We, we use the dollar as the, as the political tool. Um, we weaponize it. And it's only natural that these countries are looking for different solutions. I mean, look at El Salvador. I mean, they're, they are actually an ally of the US. They said, look, you know, we were struggling. We're in this cycle of poverty. A huge percentage of their GDP was being spent just by remittances going through companies like Western Union from the US back to El Salvador. They said, there's gotta be a better way. They, they adopted Bitcoin as an alternate currency. And, you know, I talk to friends down there and they tell me every day, planes show up, a couple hundred, you know, young Bitcoiners get off in their T-shirts and, and right. shorts and they come and figure out what they're going to do next. They're going to start a mining operation. They're going to build a hotel. They're going to this, they're going to do that. They're excited about the about El Salvador. Many of them didn't even know where El Salvador was two months ago, but they're excited. <laughs> and one of the reasons they're excited is because it's an alternate alternative to the dollar. One of my clients called and said, hey, I wanna buy a, a, um, a, a penthouse condo from Mike Cobb at, at Bitcoin Beach. And I said, well, why, what, why? I, didn't, I never knew you had any interest in El Salvador. He's like, well, you know, I'm, I'm, on, the, I'm on the Bitcoin team. I wanna support the Bitcoin team. So can you arrange to get me a, you know, a, a condo on the beach, but yeah, of course. So you know, there's um, there's a lot of reasons that 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 the lines are being drawn in the sand politically, economically. In the U.S., we have you know this new uh, politics that's built on divisiveness and you know class envy, class warfare, whatever you want to call it. All these things are are just they're crushing the dollar. It's already started and. Um, Again, I'm not an investment advisor, I'm not telling you what to invest in, uh, but it seems that it's logical that you would want to diversify and have at least some of your assets away from the dollar, whatever that means to you. And the things that, that I mentioned, real estate, gold, and Bitcoin, you know, the one thing that they all three have in common is governments can't print them. So you know, as the yeah. printing continues, those types of assets will certainly go up. Yeah, absolutely. And let, let me step back a second, because I kind of I, I kind of hinted at this earlier um, and then we went flying by real quick. But let me point out that I said there were two reasons I'm excited about this program starting right now. One is I think the U.S. is heading for economic catastrophe. But the other is that in less than a month and I want to talk about this and folks, I want you to write it down in less than a month. You were holding the 25th annual President's Week Asset and Investment Conference in Vegas. And that is just any folks, if you can get to that conference, be there because I'm going to ask Joel to describe it. To, to check out, you can go to offshore.club and click on the little events tab up there. And right there, you can sign up for it. But Joel, it, what, what we're saying here about where America is, and I want to point out before I before I pursue the PW25, this President's Week conference that you put together 25 years ago has continued to grow, brings in some of the best minds from throughout the world for asset protection and investment. Uh, but let me point out, Joel, 
our trade deficit last year was five hundred and fifty two trillion a billion dollars. Now, ready, brace yourself. As bad as that is, folks, it gets worse. Three hundred million of which is to our good friends, the Chinese. When they call in their debts, you better have your assets protection. Yeah, right, Joel? I, I think I think that's a, a very serious comment. I mean, you know, it's um, you know, you can go all the way back to Old Testament where it talks about the, you know, the lenders are the masters of the of the borrowers, and uh, the Chinese are becoming our masters day by day. Their economy is eclipsing the U.S. economy. Uh, they hold a uh, vast majority of our U.S. treasuries. Um, they control supplies of strategic materials that go into everything from telecommunications to, you know, nuclear bombs to what have you. I mean, we're just so dependent on them that um, and, and nobody's really talking about that. Uh, that's a that's a huge issue. Um, thank you for bringing up President's Week. Um, yes, we this, this is a very special year for us, uh, our 25th year. Uh, it started 25 years ago. I just had six people. They were clients of mine. We met in, in Belize to talk about their business, which is yep. where the, the term President's Week came from. They were all presidents of companies. Okay. Um, but when we were finished with their specific business, we found that we had a lot in common. You know, the you know, with challenges that we have with our families and with government and, you know, with taxes and, and, and estate planning and, and on and on and on. So, you know, we, we had, a, it was a very casual event. We had a number of meals together. People really liked each other. And uh, we said, let's do this again next year. And we did, and it, it, it's grown. It, it's grown a lot, but we've purposely kept it from turning into a mass conference where you've got, you know, I've spoken at conferences where you've got thousand people and you've got a big podium and and and, and a, you know a stage and all that we, we 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 really tried to not go that way we've kept it very intimate uh it, it's it's uh five days it's going to start on a saturday and end on a wednesday uh over the years the number of speakers has grown we invite in people who want to address that same group whether it's lawyers accountants insurance bankers you know all the professional people. We brought in economists, political people. We, the uh, event is it's pretty libertarian, honestly. Uh, you know, it's not, it doesn't favor mainstream politics, Republican or Democrat per se. Right. right. It's very libertarian. Um, one of our regular uh, speakers for many years was Harry Brown, the three-time presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party. And he always had a very unique take on things. This, right. year, our, this year, our keynote speakers, Dr. Ron Paul, we're really, really pleased to have him there. Fantastic, um, fantastic. You know, we have uh, G. Edwin Griffith, who wrote The Creature from Jekyll Island about the creation wow. of the Federal Reserve System. It's I had be, no idea you had him. He is he's coming. and, and, and he's, he's wor He is worth coming to this yeah. thing just to meet him. And by the way, you, you said in the, it's November 13th to 17th, right? Yeah, that's correct. And, and, in and, Las Vegas. Go and, to offshore.club. Click on events and sign up now, folks, because Joel said about keeping an intimate. How many people can sign up? How many total do you, do you, do you allow? Well, we're not going to let it go over 75. We've set that as a hard number. We do have a virtual streaming option. We will allow people to continue to sign up for that. Uh, but the whole idea of keeping it small, we also include all your meals. You know, it's not an inexpensive conference, but it's very intimate. You know, if you want to have... Um, lunch with Ron Paul and have a coffee with Ed Griffin and some of our other speakers like Mike Cobb, Porter Stansberry is coming. He's been a great longtime friend of mine and you know, really top notch people. And the reason the speakers come is they value the relationships they make with these outstanding attendees and the, and, and conversely the attendees enjoy the relationships and, and the ideas it's not just, you know, get up, talk, 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 and then leave. It's, you know, people come with problems. Uh, frequently, I'll see a little group. Somebody will say, hey, I have this issue. And I'll say, well, grab that accountant over there and that lawyer over there and that banker over there and get together and, you know, sit for half an hour. I'm sure you can work it out. So it's it's really a design to really help people. Um, we have um, one of the attorneys who's coming has been, uh, his name's Christopher Braun, and he's been following every aspect of the 
new tax legislation um, since back in April when uh, President Biden proposed it. He analyzed all of the proposals, the counter proposals, the the KPMG analysis, and uh, of course that it hasn't passed yet. There was a lot of pressure that that it was going to be part of the the budget reconciliation, the the uh, bill to extend the budget, uh, the deficit limit. Uh, but then they uncoupled that, so that was passed, and the the new spending bill hasn't passed, and the new tax legislation hasn't passed. And of course, there's you know there's still a lot of uncertainties. What's going to happen? You have um, Democratic senators like Joe Manchin who you know aren't necessarily walking in, in lockstep with the administration. I'm sure there will be some kind of compromise. But people come to an event like President's Week because literally they want to hear. Okay, last week this is what happened, and now this week you have basically from the middle of of November until the end of December. So you're going to have six weeks to do whatever it is you need to do. And I can't even tell you what that is because the law you know, hasn't passed yet. But if you want to be at that kind of cutting edge, here's what happened. Here's how you protect yourself. Uh, that's my main goal at President's Week. And we do have some great uh, people from the investment side also. Um, we're going to have a top executive from Coinbase uh, talking about some unique things that they offer for cryptocurrency. We have uh, a Swiss investment advisor talking about you know ways that you can really try to maintain your purchasing power um, by investing in non-dollar denominated currencies. So you know the Swiss franc has been gaining you know ten percent or so per year every year, year in year out. Uh, when I was a kid, um, you know it was five Swiss francs to the dollar. Um, if I wanted to go out with some friends and get a pizza and a beer, you know it was ten Swiss francs which was pretty cheap. I didn't really have much money as a teenager, but usually I could scrape together 10, 10 Swiss francs. Uh, that was $2. And, uh, you know, if you could find the same pizzeria and get the same pizza and the same beer, it cost the same amount, which is highly unlikely. But if, if you could do all those things, that same 10 Swiss francs today, instead of being two US dollars, would be 11 US dollars. Wow. That's how far the dollar has fallen you know, just in my adult lifetime. So, you know, we'll, there'll be people talking about that, ways to, you know, insulate your family from some taxation using different types of uh, insurance strategies. Uh, we'll have people talking about citizenship, second passports, because after all, your most important asset is yourself. So you want to be able to to protect that. So that's what we really do at President's Week. It, it, it has grown. Uh, one of my assistants literally works on that conference all year long, literally within a few weeks of the conference being over. We're already working on the next year. And uh, this year, with it being our silver 25th anniversary, we um, we wanted it to be really special. And uh, a number of the speakers have spoken over the years. And when they heard it was the 25th anniversary, I pretty, I'm pretty pleased to say that I don't think we had one person say no. So we have really great, great speakers coming from all across the country and all across the world, assuming they can get in, because some of them are still not sure they're going to be able to get in. But if if they can't come, they can't travel to the U.S., uh, we'll have a virtual uh, option for, for the speakers. There's also the virtual option for the attendees. So if you don't want to travel to um, Las Vegas, you can sign up for it. Obviously, you won't get the meals, the cocktails. You won't get those things, but you'll get all the programming uh, which will be about 20 hours of uh, uh, 25 hours of, of programming. Joel, the, you, you know, you reel off these names here. This is a, including you and Mike Cobb, Ron Paul, uh, uh, Gibbons. These these are, this is what I call it a, a major mastermind group. Anyone who's concerned about your assets, this is the mastermind group you need to be part of. Go to offshore.club, click on events. And let me, let me re-emphasize how great a threat, how important this event is because of the threat to your assets, folks. I want you to keep in mind, I don't, uh, politics is all I've ever done, okay? Um, I was a top political operative in Washington. Somebody said, whenever you say that, you sound like you should be in a confessional booth, which is true. But, but the, these people are coming after you. Right now, they're saying, well, it won't be $3.5 trillion the way Biden wants. But two things to keep in mind. One, it will be. They may act like it's only 2.5. 
uh, trillion. But under the table, they're going to put everything back in. Two weeks ago, Biden said, remember, all we need to do is pass these things. Then we can raise them right away, just the way FDR did. That's what their plan is. And taxes, taxes. So Yellen goes before Congress, Joel, and says, well, remember, repugnant person, remember, we're only going after the wealthy. And one of the Congress said, is that why you're you're going to invade the bank accounts of anybody who does six hundred dollars in transactions in a year? Doesn't sound like the wealthy. Well, of course not. It's a lie. It's coming down. I'm going to say one more thing, Joel. And folks, when you hear this, it'll make you say, I need to talk to Joel Nagel. OK, Section two of the Dodd-Frank bill. Section two of the Dodd-Frank bill says that banks can seize your assets in times of a financial crisis. I wish I were making that up. I am not making it up. Yeah, no, that's that's true. And look, the, the whole banking system was completely federalized between the bailouts and the Patriot Act and all, all this. You know, the banks are addicted to this government money. So none of them are going to say no. And if, you know, right now, Yellen could send an email out to every head of every bank in the next 30 seconds and freeze everybody's account. And that would be it. And um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, just touching back on the conference, uh, one of the things that the reason that we don't allow it to grow is because we want that interaction. We want the people who do come to have a really, really special experience. Um, I know that uh, Ron Paul, for example, just had his annual conference in uh, DC had like 3000 people there. So, you know, if you were, even if you were a major donor, you might've had an opportunity to have your picture taken with them and shake his hand. But at our event, you know, he's there with 75 people, you know, you're gonna, he's giving a speech. He's gonna be part of a, a, a round table. He's gonna do a fireside chat. He's gonna do a book signing. He's gonna sit and talk to whoever wants to talk to him. And, you know, Ed Griffin, same way. And by the way, Ed's celebrating his 90th birthday at our event. Wow. I mean, that's just unbelievable. The man is, I hope I can be, you know, well, first of all, I'm not even sure I've, I'll make it to his age, but I hope I can be half as uh, um, spry intellectually as he is when I get there. So there, it, it really is about identifying the problems and coming up with solutions. And is it perfect? No, you know, but we're thinking about it, we're asking the right questions, we're trying to come up with the right solutions to keep you one step ahead because you, like you say, that some of these forces out there are, are nefarious and, and they don't sleep, they they work around the clock. And, you know, we get these 3000 page bills, and nobody even knows what's in them. You know, Pelosi famously said, you know, we have to pass the bill to find out what's in it. I mean, that's ridiculous. I think regardless of your political orientation, you know, if I had my way, I would say no law can be longer than 10 pages and nobody gets to vote on it until they read it, regardless of how you feel about it. You have to read it first. And, you know, but coming up with these 3000 page bills, they know nobody's reading it. So they can bury all kinds of crap and you don't know who's drafting it. They're not your elected leaders. You know, they're people with their own agendas. And uh, unfortunately, the, look, we're in such a hole financially Truly, the only way to get out of that hole is going to be to inflate away the dollar. That's it. That's it. You know, That's they're, it. Not, they're not going to want to default on the debt. So you slowly or in some cases not so slowly inflate it away. You know, if you buy a Treasury bill, you're guaranteed to get your money back and you're guaranteed that that money you get back will be worth less than what you pay for it now. So who in the right mind would ever buy a U.S. Treasury bill? Well, you're precisely right. And and in these bills, are the taxes, the taxes. They're gonna keep spending, destroy the currency. And as they do it, as government becomes less and less solvent, they're gonna say, we need more money from government. Let's tax the American people more. Look, buried in this $3.5 trillion welfare bill, wealth, it's a welfare bill, two things that we need to keep in mind. And Joel, they go right to your area of expertise, the child tax credit. Now, when I say tax, I give quotation marks. Let me get my, yeah, there we go. Because 76% of the benefits in it go to people who do not pay taxes. Yeah. So yeah, that means it comes out of your pocket, folks. Exactly. That That's a complete misnomer that, you know, that the wealthy are somehow getting away with, you know, all the breaks and this and that. I mean, I, I just wrote an analysis 
uh, for Escape Artists Insider magazine last month, and we looked exactly at that. The U.S. has one of the most progressive tax systems in the world. Yep. Uh, the, the top 1% of taxpayers uh, pay roughly half of all taxes. Uh, the top 10% pay over 70% of the taxes. Uh, the, the bottom 40% pay virtually no taxes. So you're right. It's the middle class, the upper middle class and the wealthy that are, that are paying taxes. And, you know, the other thing that I found really, really interesting was if you, if you went back a hundred years, you know, back into, let's say the creation of the tax system, which took place during, you know, the beginning of world war one as a way to help, uh, finance the government, the, yeah. the tax rate. I mean, first of all, it's, it was unbelievable how short the tax forms were, uh, now, you know, I have clients that have four inches thick, you know, paper doing their doing their taxes. But, um, you know, the, the tax rate applied to everybody and the base rate was 1%. 1%. And, and that rate went up to what would today be in, in you know, converted the dollars then to dollars now would be about $550,000. That was the lowest rate from zero. Yeah. The five hundred fifty thousand dollars, you pay one percent. One percent. You hear the government talking about well, the wealthy people, the people that have the targets on their back, the people we're going to adjust. They're people who only make over four hundred thousand dollars. So now, if you make four hundred thousand dollars, you're in the top bracket. Back hundred years ago, you were actually in the bottom bracket. Yeah. And and the top bracket went. You know, it, it did go up. There was a scale. And if you made uh, the equivalent, and this is, you know, your active income, you, you maxed out at 7% at $12.5 million. Right. So if you made $12.5 million in 1913, your maximum rate was 7%. And, um, you know, now that same person will be paying well over 40%, maybe closer to 50, depending on the state they live in. By the time, you know, if you live in California or New York and you have state tax, you have self-employment tax and Medicaid and Medicare and all this other stuff, you know, you're, you're, uh, you, you know, you're probably well over 50%, quite honestly. So, you know, the, it's not that, it's not that the system's not already progressive. It's we have abusive government and um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the dairy cows are being milked and uh, they think that they haven't been milked hard enough. They want to milk them harder and, and uh, quite honestly, it, nobody's really having a serious talk about how to refrain, restrict, limit, you know, the government so that they spend less. And I'll just leave you with one more quick thought. And that is that this year, the budget, um, the tax revenue is approximately $2 trillion. And the spending bill is $4 trillion. So we're going to start the year with uh, a projection where half the money the government spends is borrowed. Yes, and just ask yourself, how, how sustainable is that, right? I mean, maybe you can get away with it for one year, two years. A number of years ago, I suffered from cancer and there was a year where that's pretty much what happened. I spent more money than I made. I, I borrowed money, I had lines of credit, I sold assets, um, you know, and that you can do that for a temporary season. But you can't do that year in, year out. And for the politicians on both sides to, you know, talk about whether they're going to spend five trillion or four trillion uh, when the revenue is two trillion, um, you know, it's it's a it's a recipe for disaster. So that's where we are. We, you know, if if I could change it at the political level, you know, I'd give my heart and soul to do that. But I think most of the people that come to something like Presidents Week, uh, they've resigned themselves that they can't change that. Um, so the only thing they can do is try to protect themselves and protect their families, protect their purchasing power. Um, and that means, you know, taking a number of moves to diversify away from the dollar, move some funds offshore, have a plan B, maybe have some real estate overseas. You know, there's a lot of strategies as to how you can you can combat, you know, what's happening. And, you know, we saw in, um, you know, uh, we saw a year or so ago when, when, uh, the inner cities were being burned and, you know, people were taking up arms and, you know, shooting each other. And, you know, my clients aren't interested in that. So, you know, it's, they're not fighting They're It's fight or flight, right, Carter? And uh, so they're, they're, the, the, the flight's in full form. If you look at the numbers of people 
expatriating, moving abroad, getting second passports and citizenship. That used to be a tiny, tiny part of our practice. It's it's hugely mainstream now. I would say one in two people that call my office, they they want to bring that up as part of the conversation. And, and you know, to me, that's it's sad, but that's that's where we are in the world today. That's where we are. That's where we are. So, folks, you got two things here that it, it takeaways. Okay, number one is remember this wealth fortress report with Joel Nagel is going to be on every Thursday at two o'clock. Every Thursday, you're going to get this kind of information, updates, insights, the inside information from the man who knows. As I said, this is America's number one asset protection attorney. And what I like about Joel, he's one of us. Okay, I mean, he was raised, you know, it, uh, blue bedrock. In a in middle middle class or lower middle class, I think. Farm kid from Western Pennsylvania. There we go. So he's one of us. So you can get the real scoop, okay? And the second is President's Week 25, November 13th to 17th. Go to offshore.club, click on events and sign up. Sign up because it's vitally important. Thanks, Carter. And and if people do have things they'd like to talk about on the series, you know, they're free to send comments or, or queries to you and you know we can try to bring them up in the course of the of the programs as we go forward there's you know there's a million things we can talk about so we might as well talk about the things that are of interest and relevant to to your audience it's fantastic joel thank you very much this is great and i look forward to seeing you again next week thank you carter good thanks to be so much. with you look forward to it thanks for joining us folks thanks for joining joel nagel and the global wealth fortress report a whole new approach to asset protection and estate planning so that now you can live the good life at a great price where the sun never sets on your financial fortress.